Hello and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. This is a podcast about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Taylor Fossack. I'm the lead engineer here at IT Pro TV. And with me today is Sarah Lichtenstein, one of the engineers on my team. Thanks for joining me, Sarah. Thanks for having me, Taylor. It's good to have you here. And today, we're going to be talking about profiling in Haskell, and in particular, this article by Jake Zimmerman, where he talks about speeding up one of his programs by 10 times, so a pretty significant improvement. Yeah, definitely. I think anything 10 times improved is uh, pretty great. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that. Can't beat 10 times better. So. Jake explains the problem he was trying to solve in this article, and uh, we'll kind of recap for our listeners here. He was at a carnival and playing this carnival game where he had a six by six grid of shapes or symbols, and you turned over some pieces and tried to see if you got a bingo, like if you lined up a whole column or a row or a diagonal or something like that. And he was interested in finding out if, or rather what the prob probability was of winning this carnival game. So how good should he feel when he wins? Is it like he win 50% of the time or 1% of the time? And he figured that he could write some type of combinatoric solution to get the exact answer, like you're going to win exactly 123 out of 767 times. Uh, but he thought it'd be more fun to write one that just generated these boards and shuffled all the pieces together and then saw if it won or not. If a task takes more than five minutes, why not program it? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Why, why sit there all day making bingo boards if you could write a Haskell program to do that for you? So he wrote this program, and it seemed to work. He didn't really talk to him much about you know, if he got the implementation right or not. So we're assuming he got the implementation right, but his first time around was way too slow for him. Uh, and his threshold for too slow is apparently very different than mine, because his first attempt took on the order of like one second. Uh, and this, I think, was to generate and solve like 100,000 boards. Mm -hmm. So for me, that seems fast enough for this problem. But uh, I definitely understand wanting to really dig into something and find out how fast can it be. And he definitely went down that rabbit hole. So he talks about some of the changes he made to his attempts. And um, the first one was to use like a single um, large integer as the whole game board because mm -hmm. with I think yeah with 36 slots on the board um, you could represent that at, in one large integer rather than having some data structure with a bunch of different fields in it right and his assumption was that if you can use one integer then it will probably be faster because you're not going to have you know as many things floating around in memory um, but it's also, I think, somewhat of a strange choice. So, Sarah, for the pro or for the programs that we write here at work, we don't do a lot of this, like really cramming, you know, getting the most performance possible out of stuff. So, I was wondering, did this look weird to you, or you're like, okay, yeah, I, I kind of get what's going on here. I mean, the idea in general of just using one integer just seems very odd yeah. to represent this whole thing. But um, he did make a point about how simple this was to implement. Mm -hmm. for him. So I guess, you know, if it's easy to implement and it works, you know, why not? That's a great point, yeah. <laughs> why make things more complicated just in, in looking for purity or something like that? Exactly. But yeah, he said he was able to pretty quickly knock out this Fisher-Yates shuffle to generate the random boards. And this used a random number generator, the one kind of from the standard library in Haskell for doing this stuff, which is, of course, just called random. And so he kind of... What else would it be called? Yeah. Why, why come up with a more imaginative name? Random works fine. Um, but as we'll discover, there's, there's kind of a problem with that. And, and what he did was he passed in this random number generator and did one step of the shuffle and gave back the slightly shuffled board and the, the like next random gem number generator. So it just keeps getting passed along to successive calls, um, which is a interesting way to do things and makes sense for Haskell because it's pure. So you have to have something that sort of implements that randomness, but um, it's still kind of strange, even to me after programming it for a while, to see that explicitly passed in as an argument. Um, so then he gets into kind of the performance characteristics, and this is where he talks about how slow it is. Uh, and again, I, 
it's crazy to me that it's under a second. He's like, ah, it's just too slow. <laughs> yeah, I found that very, very hilarious because I started reading it and he was like, yeah, 738 milliseconds. And I'm like, what in the world? How is that slow? <laughs> yeah, I would think, okay, we're done here, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fast enough. But I'm guessing based on later in this article, he talks about uh, porting some C code over to Haskell. Maybe he's a C programmer or Rust programmer or something like that where he has a kind of different definition of what it means to be performant and fast enough. Ah, that would make sense. Yeah, I'm just guessing. I don't know. Hopefully, Jake can uh, can tell us, or we could probably read and find out. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so then he gets into really the meat of what we're doing here. And uh, I guess, Sarah, do you want to kind of explain the, the process that he goes through to, to profile this code and figure out what's going on with it? So profiling in Haskell is actually extremely simple um, because you can literally just run stack build dash dash profile to build it with that and then add a dash P to your exec. And that's it. It prints you out this prints you out this like really nice profile, tells you everything you need to know, it's got all your time allocations, all that good stuff. Um, so it's super useful, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not, it doesn't really take any overhead to implement or anything like that. So definitely yeah. a great tool. Yeah, it is surprisingly easy to use. I don't know what's to think there, if it's Stack doing a bunch of lifting for you or somewhere deeper in the Stack like Cabal or GHC or something else. But yeah, you just throw this dash dash profile option onto your build and then pass another option to your to the program when you run it, and boom, you get this output that tells you, yeah, your program spent, uh, in this guy's case, 70, no, more than that, 85% of your time um, coming up with random integer values, uh, which is crazy. Um, right. And it's, it's also really useful to look at this in terms of percentage time because already I've lost track of the fact that we're only taking a second. I, I see 85% and that's way too high. We gotta make that number lower. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mentioned earlier that the the random, the like de facto standard random number library in Haskell being called random is a, a bit of a problem because it has, it's really slow, which is what this guy figures out. In his relatively small program where he's generating all these boards and checking to see if they're valid, none of that business logic is the slow part. It's the random number generation. Right. Which seems crazy, you yeah. know. You'd always think that the logic would take more time, which right. is kind of what he explains. Is that his like assumption is, oh, it's got to be the logic, and then once he starts using profiling, he's like, oh, it's not the logic at all. Yeah, which is one of the huge upsides of profiling is you write your program and don't care about what part is fast, and then if it's too slow, which isn't even a given, sometimes you can write just atrociously, you know, really slow-looking <laughs> code but then it runs fast enough because your input's not big enough or whatever. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you run into a performance problem, throw the profiler at it and you might be surprised at what you find. Exactly. Because I wouldn't have guessed at the beginning of this article that the random number generation would be the slow part. Like I can flip coins pretty fast, I can roll dice pretty fast, that's not gonna be the slow part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think, um, I think as programmers, we might be a little predisposed to think, oh, my logic must be wrong, you yeah. know? Rather than the library being the slow thing. Right, because so often, especially in the type of code that we do, the library is almost never at fault. The language exactly. is never at fault. It's always us. But that's more so for bugs than performance. Um, and you know, we rarely have reason to look at performance. Generally, things are fast enough for us with Haskell. Mm -hmm. But when you do, it can be surprising to find because I know as a library author, and this probably applies to many library authors, I don't run benchmarks against my library code. I just kind of assume that it's fast enough. And if I'm using it for a particular problem, I'll definitely make sure it's fast enough for that. But I, you know, I may not have envisioned usage like this if I wrote this library in the first place. Right. So the fact that it can be used in all these different contexts and that authors aren't typically focused on that means that, yeah, library code can be the slow part and profiling is the thing to tell you that as fast as possible. So then he gets into talking about how he, after he identified this random number generation as the slow part of his program, how he fixed it. And uh, we don't want to get too far off into the weeds of that, but it's impressive to me at least that he ported this C program into Haskell. It's been a long time since I've had reason to look at C code and I think that's true for you too, right Sarah? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Not <laughs> since uh, I think maybe junior year of college. Yeah, so it's been a while. I don't think I'd do as well as him. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks like it paid off. I mean, he sped his program up by like six times by ditching the standard library and using his own. Right, which is already a very impressive speed up. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to ask, I think, 
a very important question when you're looking at performance improvements because, well, what he asks is, what did we have to give up in order to get this performance improvement? And I feel like that's an important question because sometimes when you're focusing on sort of a sub-problem, in this case performance, you can lose mm -hmm. sight of the bigger picture. And so you can make something that's really, really fast, but then it's a huge pain in the butt to use. Um, right, and that would kind of just defeat the purpose of having it at all. You know, if it's not simple to use, then why use it? Right, yeah, ideally we could keep the same interface and swap out the internals and make it faster. That's the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. So I don't think he quite achieved that here, but it is surprising how little he had to change. If you look at the, I, obviously our listeners can't actually look at the code, but he has the, the original code that he wrote with the slow one and the new code that he wrote with the fast one, and they're almost the same. Like if you squint, they, they look the same. <laughs> Definitely. Which I think is a great metric to have in mind when you're profiling code in Haskell or really in any language is keep the call site looking almost the same and try mm -hmm. to update the internals without breaking the API. Right. Um, if one of our listeners wanted to look at this code, is this article found in Haskell Weekly? It is, as per usual. Um, it will also be in the show notes for this episode. We'll have a link to it. Perfect. Um, and so moving on, this guy, Jake, he again runs into this problem that I would not run into of saying that 126 milliseconds, the, the new runtime, is just too slow. He can't, he can't abide by that. <laughs> <laughs> 126? How slow? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it was 126 seconds, maybe I'd agree, but milliseconds, you know, yeah. I'm going to hit the return key and it'll be done almost instantaneously. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he talks about how he went on to improve it, and uh, again, the, the actual mechanics of what he did to speed it up aren't super interesting. It's that he continued to use profiling to identify the hot spots in his program. So instead of saying, well, I've swapped out the random number generator, so I can stop worrying about that part and move on to something else that I think is the problem, he ran the profiler again and discovered, no, the random number generation is still the slow part. Um, even though it's been sped up so much, it still takes a, a big chunk of the time. Mm -hmm. Which again, is really surprising. You mentioned before about how you know, libraries aren't often the problem with bugs, but can be with performance. And with bugs, when you fix them, they're gone. But with performance, right. it can't really be fixed. It can just get faster, or I guess it could get slower if you did something bad. <laughs> But isn't it interesting that, you know, you can spend a bunch of effort, you know, he wrote a whole new random number generator and... And it's still slow. And it's still the slow part. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, I, that to me is just like the, the huge positive benefit that profiling has versus kind of staring at code and hoping you can identify which part will probably be slow. Mm -hmm. um, is that it'll tell you like, no, even though you've already put a ton of work into that, it's, it's still the slow part. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I definitely think it's helpful to have that kind of information. And, you know, especially if you don't have to do a ton of setup or anything, it's such a useful tool. There's mm -hmm. no reason really not to use it, but I think it's also good to keep in mind, um, like we had brought up, the uh, kind of exchange that goes on with making something more performant versus what you're using for the program. Right. You don't want to lose track of that bigger picture. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned that it's really easy to do this, which um, it is. And it's still interesting though, because even here at work, um, we don't have, I don't think we've ever profiled our code base. Or actually, you said that uh, we did that once actually when I wasn't here, right? Right. Um, you know, when the boss is away, the mice will play, <laughs> but... Um, the boss isn't here, I, quick, profile the code. <laughs> <laughs> Cody and I were working on a, um, a problem in the code base. It's just like a bug that we had found. Um, and he suggested using profiling and I'd never used that before. I was like, what in the world? Like, what kind of profile are you trying to make here? What does that even mean? <laughs> and so he kind of explained it to me, and we tried to use it. And while we didn't use it for very long, it was still a very interesting experience to like have something tell us what was going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, you mentioned that you didn't end up using this profiling report to actually solve the problem. So something else prop, uh, propped up. But um, the profiling at the very least told you that there wasn't one thing that's taking, in this case, like 85% of the time. You know, it was, right. like, it was a bunch of little things. Mm -hmm. um, which can be a lot less satisfying. You know, if you run the profiler and it says, well, you spent at most 5% of your time in any given part of your program, 
you might have to do some harder thinking to figure out how to speed that up. Right, we were hoping for more of a straightforward answer, but I guess it's also good to know that nothing we're using is overtly wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> very encouraging. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that uh, kind of covers this blog post talking about profiling Haskell programs to speed them up uh, in maybe the best case by 10 times, but um, in the typical case, probably quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else you wanted to mention about uh, profiling in Haskell? Um, I think we pretty much covered it, honestly. Yeah. I think the only thing I had to add was that um, I've profiled some programs, uh, you know, in my Haskell career. None of them have been as great a success story as this. So it's not like, you know, throw profiling at your problem and it'll magically get 10 times faster. But right. as we discussed, it can still be validating to, to see that there isn't one huge hotspot where it's slowing everything else down and you weren't even thinking about it. Right. And I'd, I just feel the need to reiterate again that this is such a good way to think about performance problems. And mm -hmm. that to, to me, that means don't think about them at all until they actually become a problem. And then when they do, throw a tool at it that tells you exactly where the problem is rather than trying to guess. I think that's the best way to honestly look at performance problems because you should mostly optimize just making the code as the best that it can be, mm -hmm. and then after that, if it becomes an issue, yeah. to try and solve it. Yeah, and we, we touched on this already, but if you're writing the code without an eye toward performance and you're focusing on making a nice, expressive API or something that's easy to use, then when you have the need to make it more performant and you maintain that API, you're meeting both goals versus if you right out of the gate start jumping through some hoops just to write code that you think will be faster, you might end up with a much worse API for almost no benefit. Right. So I agree. Write, write the nice API, and then if you need it to be faster, go ahead and make it faster. But, you know, maybe not like less than a second is too short. To faster, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's still where we disagree. <laughs> maybe if this guy was, you know, at Google scale or writing some web service that needed to turn these requests around real fast, you know, people mm -hmm. really wanted to solve this carnival game. <laughs> um, I can see it, but it's definitely a good practice, and um, that's something that I've noticed in in my personal programming with Haskell is that you get the ability to sort of look into things that may not be worth your while to do at your day job, but are still fun and interesting, and then put another tool in your toolbox that you can use later on. Yeah, definitely. So I'll bet you know you mentioned Cody uh, doing or using profiling for a problem here at work, and I bet that's not the first time he used it. So he was you know hacking away on something at home and found that profiling was a neat tool and figured out how to use it, and then, boom, applied it at work. Cowboy Cody, I would guess that wasn't the first time he <laughs> used it. Good old Cowboy <laughs> Cody. Um, yeah, and I guess the, the final thing I wanted to mention here about profiling and Haskell performance is that it's very possible to write Haskell that is really, really fast. This guy ended up with a program that simulated 100,000 board states and checked them to see if they were winners or losers and did it in 70 milliseconds. Right. And when you look at the performance of other languages that are as expressive as Haskell, it's hard to find one that can get to be that quick. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Haskell gives us the best of both worlds when we need it uh, is awesome. I love that about mm -hmm. it. Is there anything you don't love about Haskell? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Uh, no. <laughs> Haskell is Only the perfect answer. Language. Good job. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thanks for joining me today, Sarah, to talk about profiling in Haskell. It's nice to have you on the show again. Absolutely. It was nice to be here. And thank you for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. If you liked what you heard here today, please go find out more at haskellweekly.news. This has been episode 11, and please be sure to join in next week. See ya.